Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Hello, you. How are you? Hi, so you're all welcome to the official launch of the Africa Wiki Challenge 2022. And I would want to um, particularly welcome everyone and speaking here from other countries. I know we have people from Burundi, Cote d'Ivoire, um, Nigeria and then other African speaking countries. So you're officially welcome to the campaign, like I said. So with um, our brothers and sisters from the Francophone countries, if you open your Zoom up, you can see that there is a column where um, the interpretation button is located. So you can just tap the interpretation button and then you have a direct French translation of whatever I'm saying over here. Great. So the Africa Wiki Challenge, like I said, is a writing contest that seeks uh, to promote content about Africa on the web, specifically Wikipedia. So last year, we officially launched the very first edition of the campaign. And then the theme Africa for the campaign was landmarks in Africa. So we saw contributions from a uh, lot of people, people from Africa and then um, outside Africa as well contributing content about landmarks in Africa. This year being our second edition, we are focused on the theme, projecting African culture. This is a much broader theme than the landmarks in Africa. This gives participants an opportunity to talk about everything culture. I mean, to write about everything culture. So ranging from food, marriages, ethnic groups, festivals, dance, and anything that's um, has to do with the African culture. Moving on, I would also want to introduce the programs of the South Open Foundation West Africa, who is going to be helping me with the moderation. Christopher, uh, if you can kindly introduce yourself quickly. Hi, everyone. My name is Christabel Natucholami. And as rightly said by Eugene, I am. C'est la présentation des, des panelists. And we are so much glad to have you all on board. Join us for this year's AWC 2022 launch. I hope and entreat you all to stay back and enjoy this launch as we'll have speakers from. Um, different places taking us through the importance of us having our pictures, our culture, especially outside um, on the internet for people to see what Africa truly is. So um, without wasting much time, I will go straight ahead to make a few introductions. And um, we are joined here by our guest speakers as seen in the flyers and I'll to do a brief introduction of all of them. Then after that, we take a short statement from um, a representative from the Ghana Commission. We will see the representation of the Ghana. Joining us today is Professor Professor Uchikwawa, archaeologist, archaeologist. Heritage Pages of Ghana. And we are also joined by Dr. Kiwuhu Eniyan. He is also the director at the Howard University. Also is Madam Alice Kim Kibombo, who is a member of the Wikipedia group in Uganda. She is a librarian and also a project lead. And lastly, as part of our speakers, is Lian Tete, who is a project officer at the Ghana Tourism Development Company. So ladies and gentlemen joined here today. These are our speakers for today. And I will call on Mr. Kofi Kwache, if he's here, to kindly give us a short statement. Mr. Kofi Kwache is a rep or and a program um, officer for education at the Ghana Commission for UNESCO. So if he's here, Mr. Kofi Kwache. Hello, Christabel. Yes, he has just stepped out, so I'll just speak on his behalf. Okay, okay, okay. 
Yes, so um, good afternoon, everyone from Gavua and um, everyone. Um, my name is Moses G.Y. Gimi. I'm a program officer from the Ghana Commission for UNESCO. And um, I must say that we are very grateful for the fact that um, we are in partnership with Open West Africa Foundation for this particular program. And um, working together with them, we on our side will try as much as possible to um, make the project very popular among the Ghanaian um, students. We have various clubs that we are going to make them aware of this Africa Wiki Challenge so that we can have as many people as is possible to participate in the program. So um, I would say that on behalf of the Secretary General, I, I wish everyone here a very successful deliberation. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Moses, from um, UNESCO. We are I'm glad that you are a part of um, this uh, noble um, initiative. So not to waste much time, I would want to introduce our first guest speaker. So he is in the person of Professor Kojo Gavo, and he is a, um, a professor from the University of Ghana. He's in the um, Archaeology and Heritage Studies um, Department, and he has the department. So if you can hear me, Mr. Gavo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, my name is Kojo Gavua. Uh, unfortunately, the alphabet is not in English, so it's written with a V. So the nearest pronunciation... Oh, not you. It's uh, all over. Some people even call me guava. Once I, they don't eat me, up, I accept. Yes. So it's Kojo Gavua. And uh, I used to be the head of Department of Archaeology and Heritage Studies and the former Dean of Arts at the University of Ghana. Uh, now, um, my colleagues have taken over, but I, I work with them closely. I'm glad to speak uh, on under the theme protecting African a projecting African culture. And um, when I was asked to speak to this topic, I started reflecting, which culture are we to project? When we say projecting African culture, that is to say, what do we mean by African culture? Who defines African culture? Uh, can we have clear characteristics of what we are referring to as African culture? Uh, th those are the questions that have been bug uh, boggling my mind ever since. And uh, I should say uh, that in order for us to project and protect what we may call African culture, we need to reconceptualize what it is that we may refer to as the culture of Africans. Uh, this is because for a number of centuries now, there have been conscious and unconscious attempts to disconnect Africa, Africans from their past. As an archeologist and ethnographer, I know that today, many of us Africans are disconnected from our past. When you go to the history books, not much is said about um, the achievements of our forebears beyond violence and conflict. And then there have been conscious attempts. Can we go on? There has been conscious attempts to, to take our past away from us and even what our culture is to take it away from us. I'll give a typical example that continues up to today. When you are in the high schools, you are in the schools, you are not permitted to speak even your local language. It is labeled vernacular and you are coerced into abandoning that language in that you are punished in the schools for speaking your own language. You are supposed to speak English or sometimes French or Portuguese. And it's, it's just one of the many examples. If you, you are African and you are in the school system, especially schools that are overwhelmed by Christian doctrines, and then you go visiting um, performances of the indigenous religion or local musical music and arts, music and dance performances, you risk being 
punished in the school because those have been labeled as demonic. Those are some of the things that have taken us away from who we are as a people and what our culture is. Now, the core elements of our culture that have been taken away uh, is the religion. The indigenous African religion, apart from the language, which is also core, has been taken away from us and has been demeaned as being demonic. So many of us today who have uh, adopted Christianity as if it is the only way to get to the almighty God, we, we look mean upon ourselves and others who actually uphold the indigenous religion. Meanwhile, this indigenous religion is, an, is a way of life. It's an aspect of all we do socially, mentally, or ideologically, and even permeates our material behavior. But we have been coerced psychologically, physically, emotionally to demean this, this religion. So it's a major aspect of our culture that has been taken away from us. And yet during the colonial period in particular, as um, writers, European writers, such as Terence Ranger, uh, Eric Hobsbawm have indicated, various inventions of behavior were imported into Africa. And then we were forced through the school system to adopt them. And because they have passed through generation upon generation, we now presume that they are aspects of our culture, which we uphold. Meanwhile, it's affecting us in ways that uh, do not inure to the success of our being as a people. Now, the net effect of uh, what has been done to us in terms of our culture is that, and which we sometimes uphold as our culture is that, we uphold timidity, for example, as uh, an aspect, as a good aspect of culture, and uh, when somebody is timid, then we say the person is disciplined, the person is respectful. So we don't want younger people, especially our youth, to ask critical questions. So critical thinking has been taken away from us, and we now give everything to God. Even when we see that people are suppressing and repressing us, we are in church praying, praying instead of taking concrete action to overcome this. So these are the kinds of things I'm saying that uh, border on the question, which African culture are we attempting to project? Having said that, I would like to say that in spite of all that I've said, there are core elements of the culture that we may transform positively and project because those aspects have not been taken away from us. They are based uh, mentally. They are mental structures, which are very difficult to take for, away from us in irrespective of whatever is done to us. That is the arts. The arts in particular uh, continue to be a major aspect of our culture that we can uphold and project into the future. And let me give you examples. Our dance forms. We Africans, most of the time, dance in contours. And then we dance according to how the rhythm moves us, just like the songs. So any attempt by our neighbors of the world to copy or to learn this in the so-called scientific manner does not work. Attempts have been made to copy this and then reteach us how to perform them, but it doesn't work. Because if a master drama takes over the drum, for example, the rhythm changes, everything changes. So there's no particular formula for it. The medical field, for example, is, a, is another example. The herbal medicine, it is recorded that it is documented that um, before Western European medical systems were introduced to us, our forebears were very healthy. They were healthy because the food waste differed from what we have today. We have so many medicinal plants that were used and, and then also uh, incorporated into our dietary habits. Now, those are still there. So we see that despite the effects and the positive aspects of um, uh, Western European medical systems, which we, uh, we adhere to in the hospitals and so on, many people escape this and treat themselves at home. 
And we wonder why people are administering the local uh, indigenous medical systems. It's because they have found those ones to be reliable and to be healthier than the chemicals we consume in the hospitals, sometimes uh, to make money for the pharmaceutical, the big pharmaceutical companies. So it is also an element of our culture that we can explore further and project into the future. I mentioned the dietary habits, the food waste in Africa uh, remain there no matter what. Today, attempts are also being made to replace the food waste uh, in my country in particular, we now have uh, uh, hamburgers, we now have pizza, we have fried rice and so on, taking away uh, the local um, dried cassava flour, uh, food prepared of dried cassava flour, which we call coconte, which has been proved to be very healthy. Now the youth don't want to patronize these indigenous aspects of our food, gari and so on. Okay, then the herbs, that we eat, uh, the herbs that our grandmothers ate and our grandfathers ate and they lived over hundred years. We don't want those, but they're still there. They are there and many people are now returning to them because it has been proved that these dietary uh, habits uh, are, are still viable and still relevant. So those are but a few of the elements that we can uh, uphold and project into the future. The point I'm making is that we need to research into those elements of our culture that we have carried on from generation upon generation, mindful of what was introduced to us uh, coercively, and then develop those core elements into reference points for the future. We cannot just unmask project what we generally refer to African culture. And what we refer to that culture, I'll give you two examples and then I will pass on the discussion. Today, all over Africa, there's something we call African fabric. African fabric that is printed in Manchester or in Harlem near Amsterdam and targeted at us Africans, marketed to the extent that we have internalized it we have appropriated it and it is part of our day-to-day -day activities. We use the African prints for political party activity, national uh, anniversary, independence anniversary celebrations, birthday celebrations, and so on and so forth. Now, who defines that African print? It is something which has been used to define us as Africans, that Africans, they must wear that type of fabric. They must use that type of fabric. And then the rest of the world must use other types of fabric. Why are we not normal human beings? Are we not on the same level as other people? The point is that this, for example, was constructed to generate ready market and income for Europe. The factories are still viable. They are still there giving employment to so many European youth. Whilst we consume readily, serve as the bigger market, the largest market for those kinds of fabric and then send the money outside. And then we, we remain poor here, relatively speaking. So we should be mindful of the fact that many of the things that we cherish today as African culture are things that have been imposed upon us psychologically, sometimes physically, in order to create a market that will keep Europe advancing in terms of income generation and employment whilst we are kept down and then we have become dependent upon Europe. So my take this morning is just to let us reflect and think through as I began with, how do we conceptualize or reconceptualize what we refer to as African culture? How do we redefine what we are calling African culture? I think it is the first step towards protecting or projecting what we may eventually identify as African culture. Thank you very much for your patience. And I wish this particular discourse a very good success.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof, for your insightful words that you have um, given us another call to reconceptualize what we define as African culture. And I hope that at the end of this um, launch through to the um, contest, we will be able to come out and stand out fully that this is what we call African culture. So without wasting much time, we'll go straight to our next speaker, who is South African, but is a lecturer at the Center for African Studies in Howard University. His name is Dr. Enwoku Nyandu, if I got the name right. <laughs> Doctor. You got it right. Uh, you got it right. Uh, so you, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, please. Awesome. Thank you very much. How many minutes do I have? You know, you know, professors can talk forever. So you should tell me the time. So I'm going to assume what, 15 minutes or 10? I know the students are like five minutes. <laughs> so um, I'm very honored to participate uh, in this um, world event. I, it's a very consequential event. So let me time myself. Um, it, it is, and under the theme of projecting African culture. I'd like to congratulate uh, my friends at Afro Crowd and the good work that they're doing. Uh, Sherry Antoine, Dr. Sherry Antoine and her team. I'd also like to congratulate uh, Christabel, Felicitations, uh, Monsieur, uh, the, uh, of the Open Foundation of West Africa and, uh, and her team, just Christabel. When the Africans, today I'm going to kind of like give a, a, a zoom out, give a historical perspective. That is kind of going to give you hopefully an encouragement for the great work you are going to do. When the Africans met the Europeans first, in the, in the case of South Africa, where I'm from, uh, it was 1652, there was a constellation of subjects, right? Uh, and issues on which there was furious and irreconcilable debate. What is God? Who is she or who is he or who are they? Uh, what is prayer and meditation? What is a family? Is it the nucleus family, mom, dad, children, or mom, mom, children, father, father, children, or uncles and cousins? What is a home? Is it a, is a dwelling with one roof or a couple of, um, or a couple of people, right, in a homestead. What is modesty and immodesty, right? Um, which body parts, you know, uh, must be covered and which ones must not be? The list goes on. But when the dust settled uh, of, of, in, of colonialism, the debate was also settled and it was settled in the favor of European standards. Uh, on some of these questions, let me qualify this now. On some of these questions, there was a draw, one, one, right? Uh, it, the Africans ever open-minded, a characteristic that people hardly ever give Africans for, for being very open-minded and accepting of different practices. They settled for kind of a syncretism where, you know, where, and this syncretism still exists today. In South Africa, for example, you have many people of different faiths, but who are essentially Christian in their in their practice as well, who practice Christian spirituality, and as Professor, uh, uh, honored Professor before me, uh, mentioned also medicine. In other questions, the debate was never settled, uh, friends. The debate continues till this very day on simple things, mundane things, consequential things, and you, dear friends, are part of this debate. You have raised your hands and you want to be involved in this debate. And whether you like it or not, you always be part of this debate because this debate manifests in your lives on a day-to-day -day basis in mundane things. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about one later. It is not surprising that the debate was decided by one thing, power and the colonial ability, of course, to, to, to exercise power through a monopoly of violence. But let me not be simplistic, okay? Some of this was settled by the all powerful institutions of one, the classroom, two, the church and the mosque. Today, I'm going to talk, focus on the classroom. School in Africa then was a gateway to a good life and still is, right? And it gave a person upward mobility. Some of us here who are educated, um, who are educated because someone in our African bloodline, if we're Africans, partook of the education and changed the course of their lives and yours and mine, right? But education was also gatekeeping device for information, for projecting the world to Africans and for projecting Africa to the Africans themselves. 
In South Africa, there was a word used for educated people, easy fundiswa. Let me, uh, I guess in the interest of knowledge, so we will trudge on, we've got good, uh, important work at hand. So we won't be deterred. Thanks, uh, Eugene. Uh, so education, so the educated ones were polished. Uh, the parents, even in Africa, they would long for their child to meet an easy fundiswa. So knowing that it will guarantee a good life. But the point is, the petals of culture and cultural practice, respect, and the answers to these debate questions that we talked about, the original debate, they fell by the wayside, okay? And, and they were kind of considered an opportunity cost for accessing upward mobility. And as a consequence, rural people in many African societies became considered the unpolished and they became subjects of disdain. The efforts were, and efforts are still made today in African countries, uh, development programs to kind of link in the post-colonial state to link development and the polishing of these people so, to the extent that it means polishing away cultural practices uh, without sometimes discernment, okay? Well, uh, and this, uh, it, it's important to note that there was no veneer as time went on of kind of Europeans, Africans were doing it by themselves. But of course, we know that this was a false equivalence, uh, dear friends, because um, <clears throat> it was wrong and was ill-informed. Why? The experience of Ethiopia, right? Which was never colonized. Ethiopia today has roads, Ethiopia has schools, Ethiopia has a fancy train in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia is the largest airline in Sub-Saharan Africa. In, in, they have a history of aviation and all the accoutrements of progress, right? But they, they did not share themselves, you see. So the false equi the equivalency was false. So dear friends, all of you are involved in a primordial work. It is a difficult task. It is almost impossible to complete in a single generation, but like all good works, it must be done and each generation must lift its weight. And that's you what you are doing. You are involved in reversing the original settlement of the original debate. Right? Uh, and, and whose manifestations are still current today. You are not involved in revisionism. You are involved in making a future. I'm warning you because some will say you are revising history. So what are you going to affect? You are going to affect people's perceptions outside of Africa. And most importantly, you are going to affect people's perceptions within the Africa. And whereas before the classroom played a role in determining the debates, Today, one singular if a, a thing plays a role, access. Access to the internet, access to mentorship communities, access to like-minded companions who are all over the world, us. Access to social capital, power, through which people can gain credibility and be able to make editorial decisions that stick. So I'd like to caution you right now. The original misunderstandings are not a thing of the past. If you Google right now, Zulu dancing, Z-U-L-U dancing, okay? Then click on the images. You'll see what uh, Zulu, Zulu people traditionally wear. Most people in the world, of course, don't think that Zulus wear that much. They do live in a hot place, right? So depending on who you are, this is the important part. Zulu wear is immodest. Ah, so now if you go to Instagram and Twitter and put this word, umemulo, which is a Zulu ceremony, a sacred ceremony, Ume Mulo. It's, a 20, it's, a, it's basically the 21st birthday, senior prom, adulthood in, on steroids. This is a very important ceremony. Uh, young uh, women always want to share it with their friends and so on and so forth. It's a very important ceremony. Those of you who have been to South Africa, you will know. Oh, I wanted to share my screen, but I can't. I was hoping um, uh, someone would uh, uh, enable me to, uh, Eugene. Uh, so uh, as I move on, if you Google right now, then uh, you'll see that Google, which has not censored the Zulu people, you'll see them dressed however Zulu people dress. But on Instagram, unfortunately, in the past couple of months, what has happened is a debate has taken place in which Zulu people were not involved and they've lost or are losing this debate. The debate was settled and publishing pictures in their completely traditional way, which means showing the upper body for both men and women, 
Well, now women are not allowed to do that of their own volition, right? The debate was settled then on censoring the Zulu woman body and not censoring the Zulu man body, right? In an arbitrary manner. And what's most important is that this is the, these are these people's most important time of their lives, right? So, let, oh, thanks, uh, Eugene. Uh, so I'll take, I think, 30 seconds and just share. This is what a, an umemulo is. Those of you who've been to South Africa again, uh, you will see that is what you'll see. But about 60% of the pictures that are supposed to be there, they look like this, okay? Because that's why in Africa, in South Africa, women don't breastfeed in a bathroom because the South Africans and the Zulu people have never believed that these parts in both the male and the female body are sexualized. Ah, the primordial knowledge. But arbitrarily, Twitter and Instagram now say, this is a Zulu marriage. So if, when I was getting married as a Zulu, this is how I would dress, right? But now with one fell swoop, there is now a universalism where Zulus cannot be seen in their most important days in the internet, in this day, they must now for come and all look like this, like everyone else and like everyone would wish them to look like. Uh, thanks again, uh, Eugene. So friends, what am I saying then? The misperception in recent, month has, in recent months has basically seen many Zulus getting banned Many is getting the accounts uh, basically frozen, um, basically suspended indefinitely. But uh, so why do you still see some Zulus then? Well, that means that in this debate that has taken place, it has been settled and it has been settled in a way like the past debates were settled in a way that is against the African, against the African agency, okay? So before we begin to point fingers, let me be clear. As a professor, I, I like doing the paradoxes, right? We must understand that some of the people who complained and got Zulus banned from Twitter when they're dressed in full regalia, of course, only women, which means it's gendered. Uh, some of the people are Africans themselves, you see. Some of the people who then subscribed to this Eurocentric notion of modesty that sexualizes the upper body are Africans themselves, you see. So in other words, in your work, uh, dear friends, therein lies the gist of my message two things. One, gatekeeping never ended. And hence, you are very much needed today as our grandparents needed you. Two, there are no boogie people. There's not someone wearing dark clothes in the corner, hiding, going like this thing. Let me misinform people about Africa. There are two good in people. There are people trying to show information. It just happens to be wrong. There are people who are pro probably trying to, to protect maybe modesty in other places, but then they have a brush judgment of modesty and it brushes the, the Zulu South Africans out of, of expressing their most treasured aspects of their culture. So Africans then are sometimes the biggest gatekeepers. Hence, in, we, you are in most need, dear friends, in Africa. So lastly then, I will say, I have used the example of social media to illustrate the problems you need to solve debate you must settle. So remember that the unwashed, the people that we talked about earlier, the people who, they are the ones who preserved these cultures. They are the ones who were reviled and mocked for a long time as our educated grandparents called the Mama Kaba. Now we go viral showing Zulu culture, Yoruba culture, we go viral and everyone in the world loves African culture. But it was the unwashed that preserved it much to our revilement. So in your writing, dear friends, um, please give the uneducated the benefit of a doubt. Interview them, listen to them, okay? Talk to them. They kept the faith when it was not cool about our cultures, about what it means to have African medicine, right? What it means, what an African family is. And please remain vigilant to latter day censorship that mimics the censorship of colonial days, and is, which is all based on the uh, not original, but ever all consuming misunderstanding and misperceptions. Congratulations to all of you. I wish you well. Thank you very much for the opportunity and for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. 
feel cool <laughs> for this insightful message again. Thank you for urging us to include everyone. So you've called us to add inclusion. So we should involve the uneducated persons as we add up content on the internet. And you have called us to also remain sensitive to some issues about our culture. And that is what we are going to do with this contest. Thank you very much for your time. I'll give room for the third speaker to come in with his presentation on the said topic. So our third speaker for today is Lien Tete. He is the project coordinator for the Ghana Tourism Development Company. Mr. Lien, if you are here, can we see you? Oh, okay. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Yes, please. Okay. Um, the name is actually Lien. L-E-I-N, Lane Tete. Um, I'm having the Zoom name Lane Jacobs, which is also my middle name. Okay, I am the Project Officer for Ghana Tourism Development Company Limited. That's what you, the infrastructure and investment wing of the Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture. There are 16 agencies under the Ministry of Tourism. And my uh, uh, um, company, as I said, is in charge of infrastructure. I am the focal person on the World Bank project that involves the renovation and development of heritage sites or heritage uh, and buildings, such as the famous uh, Akwemufi Museum, which is a museum that was established in the early 1930s. Um, I am currently headed by uh, Madame Loretta Kwade, and my CEO is Mr. Kojo Odami NG. So I'm sure after this presentation, I'll leave my details in terms of looking at any tourism project or like any prospect, tourism prospect that needs to be developed so far as Ghana is concerned. Uh, I want to thank uh, the organizers of this program for this wonderful opportunity for actually granting me this opportunity to be here. I'm very, very, very much later. Thank you all. And uh, if my memory serves me right, I'm here talking on the theme, the importance of projecting the African culture, but I'm coming from the tourism perspective. Okay. Uh, my bosses with their early on submissions, that's from Professor and Doctor, I just don't want to be very, very academic here. I'm trying to be very, very as in concerning what the tourism sector is concerned and uh, in terms of, let's say, the African culture. So as uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, Professor Guavaos, sorry, I can't pronounce the name, right? Yes, yeah, said, um, who defines the African culture? And this, this question, I look, if you can hear me, please. Yeah, we can hear you. Lee. Okay. Yes, who defines the African culture? And uh, as I said, I don't want to go deep into the academics. Yeah, so this simple defi definition from Edward Taylor or Tyler in the early 20s, I, I seek to simplify the definition. So culture refers to the material or the non-material, in the other sense, material what is seen and the non-material what is not seen that characterizes a group of people and legitimizes their position as a member of a society. So this brings to the fore the beauty and the, the, the wonderful aspect so far as culture is concerned. Culture, there is one thing we call culture shock. We've been hosting tourists and time with that number and every now and then right from the airport, so they get to, let's say, attractions and they are always jaw dropped, kind of shocked about what goes on. But culture is not the same with everybody. Culture varies and culture is dynamic. I just don't want to stick to the material and aspect of culture. I just want to come in in that regard where the value of culture, I mean, in the, in the definition of Africa, Africa has so many values that characterizes us as, as Africans. 
then I'll be a bit biased because I'll be Ghanaian. So one way or the other, I'll be chipping with, I'll be chipping with some Ghanaian examples. Yeah. Okay. So um, over the years, it's it's indispensable that the culture, or sorry, the African culture has traveled for whatever reason. I would just like to touch on a few material aspects of the African culture. Growing up, uh, I remember we were kind of westernized, so we used to listen to the likes of salt and pepper, where I don't know if maybe you know the, the uh, Shuperu dance or something, yes. And what's so fascinating and the likes of Queen Latifah in the interesting sitcoms where they actually adorn themselves with the beautiful kente clothes of Ghana, where you get people wearing the, the how do you call it, the kufi cap uh, made in kente. And that goes a long way to say that the African culture cannot be stopped. Whether you like it or not, the African culture will definitely fly across the shores of Africa. And that, that's, that's the beauty of the African culture in the sense that it has what's called faced a strong, strong resilience over the years. And, and, and uh, I was just talking to one of the organizers. Uh, it looks like the videos that come in one way or the other, they, sorry, the illicit videos that come in one way, it looks like the, the, there is what you call an opposition, an opposition in the sense that this culture that we are talking about, like we are in again, we are uniting, trying to promote our culture. And, and we know, we know, we know that every time there, there is this, a, a unification of the black race, there is always a strong opposition. I just don't want to go deep into that thing. Okay, so, and, and one practical example, when we talk about music, from the advent of slavery, one of the things that makes us unique is our music, that's the African. And, and it's kind of baffles me how I was watching uh, 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 Finding Roots. Uh, uh, I don't know if you know Dr. Henry Louis Gates Senior, where people in America are not using their DNA, DNA to track where they come from in Africa. And I had to watch a documentary of Quincy Jones, where after the, the DNA test, it shows that it comes from a section of Liberia where the only beautiful identification tag is music. So you, 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 if you are a music fanatic like myself, where you know that the Quincy Jones are, Quincy Jones is very instrumental in, in, in the in rearing tyrants like the Jackson Five, which later birthed uh, Michael Jackson. And so it, it, it comes again to the play that we, we are a resilient force so far as culture is concerned. Then let's come to our instruments. Uh, I was having a discussion with a friend of mine from the Ghana Museum and Monument Board, and, and it's like, if if we had to go deep in history, in history, you we'll know that the certain instruments, certain instruments are not popular in the world because of the African. If we talk of drums, when the African used to kill goats maybe take the meat for a, a sumptuous meal, he knows that he has to use the skin for leather, which can be carved onto a wood or something that will actually create music for entertainment purpose. Sometimes it, it, it's kind of funny wh where this, this uh, 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 knowledge comes from. And once again, that gets to the point that the African, the African culture, it's something of beauty and 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 it's a friend of mine used to say that whilst the the African was observing keenly, the white man was writing. <laughs> yes, so up to now the, the the pyramids of Giza in Egypt are still a wonder. People, a lot of white uh, 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 professors and whatever will tell you that the, the pyramids of Giza were built by aliens that we, 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 used to, <laughs> we used to live with aliens. Africans were blessed to, to be with aliens in a sense that these people have the greatest IQ. They have to teach us how to No, but these things are there. The only problem we have is that did the African actually document 
And that one, again, is, is a question because when you go to places like Egypt, the hieroglyphics, you go to places like Congo, the rock paintings, all these things are evidences of the African cultural revolution. Okay, so let me not waste much of your time as I try to touch on the values that, that needs to be projected. I think the African culture, that's, that, let's say, our value system, it's something that we need to project to the world. Yes, culture varies. The way you understand something is quite different from the way I get to understand certain things because of what's the cultural perspective. But I think the African value, it's something that is worth projecting. And, and um, we get to issues where we have uh, incidences of uh, uh, shootings at, uh, at uh, uh, elementary schools, uh, shootings at restaurants, shootings at cinemas, shootings at uh, 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 supermarkets, malls, and all that. But you, you have to get to the point where you have to realize that I'm not saying the African traditional value so far as culture is concerned, is the best. No, I'm not saying that. But it looks like the African cultural value is something that must be celebrated. It's something that must be held in high esteem and something that must go beyond the shores of Africa. Because sometimes we even look at our proverbs. Amega, and there is this famous proverb that he make a Jason, she can't bat way in Ano. So in that sense, I will explain, don't worry. They said the chick says, sorry, the eye says he doesn't care. But when the chick is slapped, the eye suffers. It, this, this proverb goes a long way to say what, to, to discuss the beauty of what you call the socialist concept of the African, where everybody's child can be disciplined by another man where you see a boy messing around on the street, you being caught and given two, two, two spanks on the bat and the person is corrected and the mother or the father comes and says, oh, thank you for lashing my son. Yes, th th this socialist concept. But now we've gotten to the point where uh, 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 in the concept of what you call the media imperialism, where the media has become a propagating tool of, of positioning and uh, not only positioning, uh, uh, burdening us with what you call Western cultures and Western ideologies. Hey, growing up in somewhere early early nineties, and you you can beat somebody's child. There, you go coffee, and the mother comes around. You explain what the child that did, and it's okay. But now, hey, what be you? Because when you beat somebody's child, you be like, it's you beat somebody's child. You like, hey, do you give my child? Do you pay my child school fees? Do you give my child feeding money? And, and th this thing is not the African. This thing is not the African. I was reading a book by Dr. Kwame Nkuma, and he said that the, the, the Stalinism or concept of Stalin, the communist, what Russia is practicing, what China is practicing now, the, the, the concept of socialism wasn't, it, it does not come from the, 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 the East, such as Russia and the rest. It comes from Africa where everybody's child is everybody's child. So touching on a few value system of the African, okay, let me come back. So when we talk about value, what is the definition of value? According to the long Dictionary, the word value is defined as the degree of usefulness of something. Quality is something which makes it helpful, useful or desirable, a standard or idea which most people have about the worth of good qualities. Notwithstanding, the word values refers to attitude, beliefs, behaviors, action that are cherished and acceptable standards of behaviors which each society expects that members should abide by. Now, so talking about one great value system of the African is the family, where marriage is considered the most uh, 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 valuable institution that forgive me if i have to say this i know we all come with diverse views in terms of sexuality where now the white man or the the, the, the western man is telling me that there have been evidence of, of homosexuality in in africa there have been evidence of homosexuality in africa which is evidence on some rock paintings somewhere in congo and any and and, and, and it's kind of it's kind of it's kind of funny 
because we know this even when people tend to act forgive my diction in, in a girlish manner or being effeminate we tend to say as the african person that's kojo besia which is defined as in, in the fanting language or yebeni and as or yebesia so we cannot differentiate the sexes and in in science will tell you this is what you call hormonal imbalance so maybe the testosterone is kind of overshadowing the estrogen or the estrogen is kind of overshadowing the testosterone in, in both sexes where women will have, let's say, deep broken voices where men will start having thrilling voices like women. So all this thing, so there is no concept. So marriage in that regard is, it's, I, I don't really want to delve deep in that sense because that's when the question of polygamy is comes to play that why should a man a man marry more than one wife and i just don't want to go into into that angle so the, there's the value system and 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 uh, one other key factor is what you call humanity and brotherhood if if you you quite remember in my early submission that's in the proverb i just said Every, you you we live in, in a village the a village where your child is not only your child it's another man's child we we are not we, we used to live in a system where uncles can adopt you know uh, uh, their, 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 their brother's kids or their sister's kids and take care of them as their own biological uh, children but we have moved to the extent where this then is no more or to that angle of what you call the Western ideology coming or coming into our 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 setting. Now, okay, I just don't want okay, to. Hey, Mr. Lin, one minute, please. Yeah, we have okay. about two minutes more, so. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Thank okay. You. I, I, I'll, I'll, I will try my best. Okay, so Thank looking you. at um or, or hospitality in that regard, the the Ghanaian have been really hospitable. That kind of gregarious and sociable attitude where we tend to welcome foreigners. Let, let's put this in context. Where um the the Portuguese first arrived in the Gold Coast in 1492 and built castles. I can imagine that then a uh, 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 article the then chief was Nana Kwamina Ansa. Seeing somebody who is quite different from your race, you are looking at somebody whose skin is quite pale and you are that, but the, the African accepted the, that individual into the system where there was trade, which later the West happened. The castles which was, was meant to harbor uh, goods and all that became actually human, a, a place of storing human cargo. So uh, 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 sometimes we now, uh, I'm talking about the African or diaspora community, where we now have to get to the point where we realize that the evidence of this a commemorative past or this relic past where we have forts and castles dotted, dotted along the coast, the Atlantic coast. This is not a thing of sorrow. It's a thing of courage and resilience and, and the, beautif the beautiful aspect of the, the, the African cultural value, which is hospitality. So when you see force and castles dotted on our coastal bed, it shouldn't be a thing of sadness. It should be a thing that the African was able to welcome somebody that he, he or she has not seen before. Where you travel to Europe and you actually, if you don't have a place to stay, you can be in the snowstorm and die. But it is not in the case of Africa, where even if you come, the stranger knocks at the door, oh, I am, I am, I am lost. Can you help me? When the person is even fed, clothed, giving food, and even bathed. So in, in that sense, so now this relics of the past, which has become what you call evidence of the wicked past, let me put it that way, but it should not be accepted in that regard. So in the year 19, sorry, in the year 2019 and 2018, I'm talking about the year of 10. Now, this evidence of the wicked past or the commemorative part, I'm coming from the tourism perspective, has become a, 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 a thing where we tend to welcome the, I won't say a lost race because you are not lost. Africa is not lost on the map. Africa is still alive and thriving. And talking to the African diaspora uh, the, the family, where you come and you come, you realize this is my people. 
this is my home, where uh, uh, the president, uh, His Excellency Nanado Danko Akufado, went to the United States, spoke to the Adinkra group, where he welcomed them, you need to come back home, which birthed the year of return. And this year of return actually wasn't something that uh, came out of, 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 of a sad thing, yes, but it came out in the sense that it generated wealth for the, the, the Ghanaian society, which has now been used for something more beneficial that to grant a platform for this diaspora co uh, 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 com com community to come back and feel at home, where we have what we call it generated a year of return, only generated 1.9 billion and generated an amount of, of, of there was an, a, a growth of 18% in the tourism sector, which uh, uh, I wouldn't say COVID came to the disrupt in the 2020 was actually set to have what to call beyond the return. But we all know, uh, brother, COVID came to destroy or ban travel made movement. I tend to uh, close my submission with one or two things that the, the you and I, we need to get to a position where we need to project the African cultural value. But we need to look at the challenges that will come to us. Yes. Now, we have what we call the common platform, which is the media platform. It is beautiful for the African to cook nice uh, ba, a negusi soup, or to cook, uh, uh, prepare fufu, and showcase it on the internet, but not just come to the internet, the African come to the internet, excuse my language, and twerk, and to show your backside. No, it is not the thing. So let's look at some of the challenges of promoting the African cultural value. The activities of Western explorers and missionaries and which have insulted in the loss of respect of our traditional objects. So we you know we have a, 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 a terrible past, I always put it as a terrible past, where missionaries or explorers not only came for the greater good, but they came for the greater West in that sense. Then we also have to look at where we have to talk of the, 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 the ability of an African to be really, really, really proud of the culture where we are not going to cower each and every day. It is beautiful. Maybe a president can travel outside the country and wear the African prince through and throughout. Not only when he gets, uh, gets to a meeting, buy from the tarmac. So oh, I realized that my bosses are telling me time is not on my side. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Jacob. That, that's a wonderful presentation. I like the fact that you said we should be proud of where we are coming from and that Africa is not lost. So there is a call and a need for us to project what people have not seen. And bear in mind, what we put out there will cause people to come and see what is really happening in Africa. So... We are comedians, yes. And okay, so at this moment, we'd like to take uh, a group picture. So I like for all of us to turn on our videos on. So we take this picture quickly. Then we can continue with Alice from Uganda. I'm kind of very, very sorry that where I am uh, is kind of terrible. The environment is so cold because I have to rush quickly into a meeting. So I was just at the meeting area trying to do this presentation. I'm very, very sorry. Okay, Jacobs, that is noted. That is noted. Hi, can everyone please turn on your cameras? Great, great, great. Oh, I'm seeing lovely faces here. Wow, <laughs> lovely smiles behind the camera. Um, we have a few more to go then. Okay, so Joseph, Doris, Nada, Stella, Steven, JB, can you all please turn on your cameras? So we take a group picture, then we proceed.
Okay, so I think we should just proceed with what we have now and then we'll take another one um, at the end of the process. So and on the count of one, two, three, can we all say cheese? So one, two, three, cheese. Cheese. <laughs> <laughs> that's nice, that's nice, that's nice. Thank you, everyone. Okay, okay, okay. So like I was saying earlier, we are all Wikimedians and we are all interested or have that zeal to project our culture on the internet through Wikipedia. And to help us tell us the importance of having our pictures and our content on Wikipedia is Alice Kibombo from Uganda. She is a librarian and a member of the Uganda Wikipedia and user group. Alice, your audience. Thank you very much. Are you able to see my screen now? Yeah, we can see. Funny thing oh. is I can't see my own screen. <laughs> I think there's All right. a blank. There's okay, a blank. Yeah. All right. I'm still not able to see my screen from here. So just give me a minute. Technology plays me, not to mention uh, Airtel Internet on a Friday afternoon in Africa. But I just, okay, there, now I can see my screen. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. I do not know if the organizers played me. I don't know what words to say after hearing uh, or listening to the very distinguished presenters that came before me. I was even wondering if I could measure up, but hey, let's see what goes on. So my name is Alice Chibombo Ekanya. I am a librarian indeed, as I've been introduced, but I am also um, a Wikimedian. So in my nine to five, you'll find me at the Gute Zentrum. And then at hours like this, I'll be here talking about something that is close to my heart from experience as well as from practice. So uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about the relevance of projecting glam related content on wikipedia which is the um, the encyclopedia project of the wikimedia foundation uh, the wikimedia foundation has very many overlapping projects but there's this specific project that deals with encyclopedic information and it is known as wikipedia so when we come to wikipedia there are knowledge gaps. They are always going to be there unless we make a concerted effort. And even the efforts we make really are more in closing that gap. We may not be able to close it 100%. And we realized that there was a lot of information that was missing from the information sector, particularly from the memory institutions that are are in the acronym GLAM, but which are galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. And uh, a lot was missing. It was just not the content. It was not the representation of the object, but the very fact that Wikipedia uses different facets of information literacy, we were missing out on the particular expertise that information workers could bring to the management of information on the encyclopedia project. So how does that relate to culture? Um, there's something that um, all the previous speakers have mentioned, but this is how I put it. As digital access rises and technology comes in and all that and everything in between, Africans are increasingly facing the challenge of having our contributions either being straight out dismissed or simplified or negated because they do not exist in a medium or format that is acceptable in the Western world. So how information is stored and presented is still largely governed by a Western view, but that doesn't mean that we didn't have information within our societies before that. We had information, it persists, and it informs the culture that we have. 
a lot has been said about culture, so I won't go into that. Culture is a diverse notion. It is not universally accepted, but wherever you are geographically, politically, in so many spheres, the culture in that area tends to influence not only our worldviews, it influences our beliefs, it influences how we cooperate with others, and it also influences our value systems and the way we approach with dealing with information. And when we look at GLAM, a crucial mission of these institutions is to provide access, not just to knowledge, but also to culture, to help not only you, but also me and my children to understand, to broaden the understanding that we have about ourselves and the world. So this is how glam and culture are related, ladies and gentlemen. Now let us look at how this thing exists, how we are represented on the world's largest online encyclopedia. Just a few facts. Wikipedia is one of the most visited sites the world over. I think it's um, gaining prominence. It's in the top five, yeah? But when we come to that platform, we have so many languages. But let's look at English Wikipedia, yeah? Only 5% of the 6 million plus articles, subjects, themes, objects that are presented or are re being represented on Wikipedia are about Africa. And even when that content is there, it is not a guarantee that it is going to be a, from memory institutions or it's going to be about culture. It will probably be about individuals. It will be about um, achievements, but you will search very hard to be able to find something, for example, about the specific drums that come from your tribe, they will all be lumped there, some homogeneous entity. So if we are going to improve, not just the visibility of our content on this platform, but also the availability of content, then asking the right questions at the right time is a core part of us formulating an effective content strategy. And we are not able to discuss that without looking at some of the dimensions that form how information goes onto Wikimedia. For example, as we speak, do we know how much content we have across all the Wikimedia sites? Do we know the quality of the content that we have being represented there? Do we know who owns? It's given out under a free license, but do we know who owned what went on there? And if we know them, why do we not have any more from them? Do we expect to represent the poorly, to correct or improve the poorly represented content there? And then, you know, Wikimedia, the Wikipedians are a community. We edit collaboratively, it's a volunteer effort. So who is going to rewrite these stories? Who is going to be seeking out for this content? And then who has the overall responsibility for ensuring the quality, if that is what we are looking at? It's one thing having the quality, sorry, the quantity. It's another thing looking at the quality. And then lastly, do we know if any of this content is, is syndicated from other systems or platforms? These are the dimensions we have to consider as we are looking at forming an effective content strategy for Africa-related content on Wikipedia. So before I go into the relevance, we need to, you know, look a little bit at the context. Uh, this was something I extracted from um, UNESCO's recommendations concerning the preservation of and access to, digi uh, to documentary heritage in digital form. Because if we are going to participate with Wikipedia, it's in a digital form. So I've edited it a bit, but clearly we know that we live in a digital age and uh, Sorry, I've, I noticed this has been 
on just uh, give me a few seconds. Okay, so clearly we live in the digital age and avenues for access are increasingly becoming available online and offline, yeah? And this access is supplemented by a host of digital informations and the most primary ones we can think of is searchable online content. So it is crucial for memory institutions and at memory institutions, I'm not only talking about the traditional ones that we know, because those also come with a host of challenges with a myriad of issues. But you and I are living memory. We have witnessed some events in our lifetime. We have partaken or we have been part of events that form the memory. So it is crucial for memory institutions to have a web presence, including a portal to our own collections. Yeah. So as the public increasingly seeks instant responses, it's easy for them to assume that if this content is not online, then it does not exist. Yeah. So the information we have in whatever form, whether analog, whether digital, let's structure it with the available technology, with the available expertise to international standards so that it can be presented in a machine readable format that is globally searchable as well as linkable. And now I come to this then finally, ladies and gentlemen, why project Africa, especially on the world's largest uh, online encyclopedia. This is something that has been going on for forever, but this, this um, how can I say, it's not a perception, it's actually a belief that Africa is a homogeneous entity. That Africa, I don't know if you even know that site called Africa is not a country, but Africa to some people, especially in the West, seems to exist as the country that they know. So we are collectively referred to as Africans, which is good for Pan-Africanism, but there are some things that are unique to me as a Ugandan. There are things that are very unique to me as a Ghanaian. There are things that are very unique to me, for example, as a person coming from Eritrea or Ethiopia. So we are not a homogeneous entity. And because we are not a homogeneous entity, there are different things. It's the, it's the same thing. Maybe the, it's the same food all over, but we prepare it differently depending on the country that we are coming from. It's the same dance, but maybe it's used to commemorate different things. And if you look on Wikipedia, one of the like it is so in your face about how we are being represented as a homogeneous entity. It's easy to find things like culture of Africa. I dare you to do that on Wikipedia right now. Culture of Africa is represented as one article. Do not be surprised if you find things like African film or African dance or African food. Never mind that some people eat egusi, I eat matoke, uh, others eat gonja. So we are being lumped as a homogeneous entity. So it's your responsibility, you and I, to bring out what is unique about that part of Africa that you occupy. Then this is a bit technical, but there's something as information workers we call primary source literacy. It goes back to my complaint that our contributions on the international stage are being plain outright dismissed because of the medium in which they exist. And in Africa, our primary sources are word of mouth. So because it exists in word of mouth, it is not applicable. This is where primary source literacy comes in. It is not something that you will have to go to school to learn, but you're going to learn it in your particular corner of Africa, appreciating the context of the story, the background, the story behind the story, the explanation, the environment, the logic, 
And when you know and appreciate and can apply primary resource literacy, then you can better devise means of now capturing it in a format that's going to be accessible to all. Because we are slowly moving it away, uh, moving away from it, but it is a very, very valuable skill. It does not exist as a binary that either you have it or no, no. It exists on a spectrum and we all have little bits of it that might be but that might need to be refined if we are to be able to comfortably contribute to the platform that is wikipedia and then project ideas on this platform are inspired and enabled by the av availability of relevant data if i want to capture a dance if this dance did not exist in uganda there would be no idea for me to capture it on video there would be no idea for me to write about it or take pictures, yeah? So this data, the raw forms of the data that we need, they exist. And when we have primary source literacy, you will get the project ideas. And then when we look at things like Mr. Google, we'll notice that the major search engines are focusing on creating the best possible user experience. Remember now that people are looking for relevant information. So the sites that have the most relevant information stand to gain the most visibility. So if we do mass uploads of this information, relevant information properly cited, they will stand to gain visibility. And then finances and expertise are one of the major challenges that come with participating or contributing to the online debate as well as the platform that is Wikipedia. But the Wikimedia Foundation has given us opportunities, opportunities that come with funding. So our applications for funding are much stronger or they stand a better chance if we can provide evidence for us being able to work with that given set of information that we have, yeah? So if Africa-based user groups and communities are interested in sharing their information or what's unique to their culture for a number of, uh, of purposes, then we need to be proactive about documenting it. But if you're not interested, your donors are also not interested, yeah? And then we also look at balancing the narrative. And the thing that actually comes to mind now is poverty porn. You know those images that you see that um, are, are or were associated with Africa, that every time you see the representation of an African child, it is them waving an American flag because every African child's wish is to go to heaven and to go to America in that uh, in respectively, yeah? And uh, these are the pictures they show. Uh, four children eating uh, uh, from a bowl and then maybe children eating fish when they are naked, forgetting that maybe the fish is very smelly. So children are asked to, because children are very messy when they are eating and the soup is going to spill on their clothes, yeah? They are asked to take off maybe their shirt and stay in a short or when they are very young and uh, their nakedness has not been sexualized, they can stay naked and eat a meal. We are all familiar with these things if you've grown up in Africa, yeah? So contributing content from GLAM to Wikipedia is going to balance the narrative, yeah? The educators, the researchers, and all the general users out there that are looking for free and open images and content are more inclined to use the high quality, openly available content that we are going to provide through the various means that are within our reach, yeah? And then there are works that are not in focus. You know, people are not going to talk about what they do not know. But when you put it out there, it raises questions, it brings ideas, it creates um, opportunities for collaboration. So projecting African content from glance on Wikipedia helps bring works in the periphery into focus. Things stop being borderline, yeah? So when collections are worked and works are made openly available, these works are going to get highlighted in different ways. 
And because these are different ways, they are going to draw the attention of different users and the general public. Now, if you go online, there's something called metadata. That's the data of the data. So the detailed metadata, and again, bringing up to machine readable standards can increase the discoverability of our, of our output here. Yeah? So lastly, I would like to share my experience working with this. Um, before I <laughs> retired back into being a, an ordinary Wikimedian, I, I was privileged to serve as the Wikimedian in residence with AFLIA, and I was uh, part of a project that was known as uh, the Wikipedia in African Libraries project. It was a result of a, of a partnership between AFLIA and the Wikimedia Foundation. The Wikimedia Foundation had the funds and AFLIA had the network. So as technology grows, uh, leaps in education abound. We find that Africans or citizens of African countries are becoming increasingly educated, they are becoming increasingly professional, and they have very specialized areas of work. And our particular focus was with the network of information workers that AFLIA is responsible for. And uh, this network is spread across over 30 countries. And one of the challenges with working with Wikipedia is that um, a number had the desire, they had the access to the information, but they did not know how to use this platform. And working with Wikipedia, like I keep saying, it involves so many facets of information literacy that many of these people in this network had by virtue of their work. So it was for us to leverage the existing skills they have and how they can then use them to participate in this project that is known as Wikipedia. So it took place over 12 months with effect from September 2021. And we used a revised and adapted OCLC curriculum. We had uh, one pilot group and two main cohorts, but at the end we had maybe 450 participants. And for the for liaising with the community, we use the, the information workers themselves. I will use information workers because it wasn't strictly made up of libra librarians. We had archivists, we had curators. So we used country champions. And then we also collaborated with experienced Wikimedians to facilitate the learning. Hey, I do not know everything, yeah? So I will share a link to the dashboard and also a link to the report so you can see the results. But before we started it, let me give you some context on it. We ran a survey uh, across the section of people that we were targeting and we had around 458 responses. And uh, to my not shock anymore, around 60% were not aware of this source. It had been so maligned within their communities, yeah? It had gained such a bad reputation and they even did not know that there were Wikimedia communities in their midst that could support them. And a number of them, uh, a large number, more than 50% were actually in administrative positions. And why is that important? They were then able to use their influence to make Wikipedia an integral part of the operations in their information institutions. And a number of them were actually quite young. In Uganda, you're considered a, city, a senior citizen at 35, but a number were not senior citizens if they are to go by Ugandan standards. So a number were not uh, senior citizens and they were eager to take this up. So at the end of it all, um, some of the tasks that we gave were to contribute images about African information institutions or write about things that are specific to their culture, which would include a practice, a right, 
a, a, a something a commemoration a site or something so i like to think that the content increased whether or not you're checking out for it the content is there and i also like to think that the students have then gone on to do signs and wonders in their communities ladies and gentlemen that is the extent of what i know i'll hand back to the organizers okay thank you very much Addis, for this wonderful um, presentation i mean glam actually entails a lot a lot and today you've made us see the relevance of it and we are hoping that at the end of the contest we will be able to um, represent africa based on the quality and quantity of information we put out there ladies and gentlemen at this point I'd like to acknowledge our partners who have helped us in the organization of this year's um, Africa Wiki Challenge. And I would like to say thank you to Afro Crowd. I would like to also say thank you to AE Media, News Ghana, Ghana Web, Advanced Media, Africa Web, and Wikimedia, uh, our biggest of all. Thank you, as well as Ghana Commission for UNESCO. Thank you so, so much for your support. I'm not going to leave our local organizers out because without them, we will not be here as well. So I would like to say thank you to the organizers from the Wikimedia Foundation, from Sudan Wikimedia Community User Group, from Wikimedia User Group Burundi, Wikimedia User Group Benin, Wikimedia user group Arusha and Nigeria, as well as Wikimedia Cote d'Ivoire, as well as Master Wiki Hub. We want to say thank you to you all for your support. Like, want to say thank you everyone for joining. Well, before we we talk about Africa Wiki Challenge itself, I'll give the opportunity to Eugen to play the video now, as as things are set. Let's stay tuned and watch the video. Then we can talk about how to participate in this year's contest. Thank you. So, the Africa Wiki Challenge is an online campaign that is aimed at generating African related content on Wikipedia. It is an annual competition aimed at improving the statistics of content about Africa on Wikipedia and its sister projects. Each year, participants are taxed with contributing content according to a particular theme. Each campaign solicits written content on the diverse significant elements that fall under the theme. The theme for 2022 is projecting Africa's culture. The campaign will also encourage visualization of articles by adding or uploading photos, audios, or videos. In depicting Africa's culture, participants can consider the following, tribes, festivals, food, marriages, and rites of passages. Okay, thank you, Eugene, for, for the video. So as I said, we are going to talk about Africa Wiki Challenge, and the video has rightly made it known that we are looking at projecting or soliciting or documenting information or content relating to our culture that has to do with our tribe, talking about our people, our marriages, our family settings, our food, our festivals, and many more. So knowing that we must put all these informations on GLAM, it requires that as you do the content writing, you add a bit of pictures to it so that it can draw people, as the tourism man said, what you put out there will draw people to come to see what actually is going on in your country. So it will also tell that Africa is not just an island or a forest-based um, continent with monkeys and the rest, but we actually have people living in it with beautiful culture. 
So yes, one would ask, how can I participate in this year's contest? All you have to do is first have a Wikipedia account and then if you find yourself in any of the communities organizing Africa Wiki Challenge, you can sign on to their dashboard or you can sign on to the general dashboard of the Africa Wiki Challenge. The links will be placed in the chat um, for all to see. Then after signing on, you can then go ahead to add content, edit content relating to Africa on the internet. So if Eugene is here again, he can play the second video, then we can officially launch this year's Africa Wiki Challenge. And while we wait for Eugene, I hope you are all excited wherever you are in your various countries, because we want to see what is going on there. And like I said, I'm in Ghana actually. So here, when it comes to my culture, the festival celebrated here is Homoa, and the meaning has to do with hooting at hunger when um, our ancestors were moving from one point to the other and finally landed here in Ghana. Uh, they came up with this festival called Homoa. So we celebrate it in every August, and it has to do with hooting at hunger. The rituals have started, and yes, Eugene is ready for us for the second video. Let's stay tuned. Thank you. Um, thank you, Christopher, for um, that information. Um, so before we play the second video, I would also want to add that some people uh, might be new to Wikipedia and then are, are joining um, this um, lunch for the very first time. I would also want to say that we'll be holding virtual training sessions where we'll teach you exactly how you should edit Wikipedia and then how you can contribute content um, on the web. So I'm going to paste the link um, to our meta page where you can find every information that you need to know about the contest and then I would also paste the link to our telegram group where you can join the telegram group and then ask anything that relates to um, this contest and then how exactly you can participate so that being said um, let me play the second video for us and then kindly note that this video is just um, visuals and then has um, no sound so enjoy So thank you um, everyone for um, your patience and, and everyone for joining this contest. I also want to ask if there are any questions before we officially the launch. Africa Wiki Challenge is an online company. <laughs> um, any questions from anyone? Uh, very quickly, uh, there's so many good, um, so many good uh, presentations today. Um, some videos that you played. How can we, how can we um, uh, get copies of that, or um, will there be an edited version that we get to see later? Okay, thank you so much, Sherry. So we are currently streaming live on YouTube, and then this um, session is also recorded by us. So right after um, the launch of the contest, we'll make available the Zoom for everyone um, on YouTube. So you can kindly subscribe to our YouTube on Open Foundation West Africa, and you can find every content that you need to know relating to this contest. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, Sherry. 
it very much did. Thank you so much. This has been amazing, despite the uh, uh, difficulties. And um, I really think that this is going to be an exciting year. Thank you so Thank much. You so much, Sherry. Thank you. Um, any other question from anyone? The floor is open to everyone. So kindly ask the questions. Okay, so if there are no questions, um, okay, so someone, Francis, Francis is asking, what are the prices for this year's challenge? Oh, so um, the very first when I is getting a laptop, second when I is getting a tablet, and then the third when I is getting a hard drive. So does that answer your question, Francis? Okay, any other question? Okay, if there are no questions, my colleague here, Christopher, the programs officer, I want you to kindly join us as we officially launch the second edition of the Africa Wiki Challenge, themed projecting African culture. Okay, thank you very much, Jane, for everything. I want to once again thank everyone for your patience, your time, and and Yes, above all your patience. So without wasting much time, I declare this year's Africa Wiki Challenge with the theme Projecting African Culture officially launched. Hooray to all of us. If you can all kindly turn our cameras on. Cameras on, please. Cameras on. Cameras on, please. Wait, wait, wait. On. Oh, are we shy? Come on, it's the launch of the second campaign. Uh, please, I can't turn my own. Is this your good mind? Oh, okay. Um, let's quickly Ooh. recommend that then. <laughs> okay, great, 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 great. I think it's working now. Okay, three, three, two, one, go! Hi, everyone. <laughs> great, 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 great. So we want to thank each and everyone for um, joining us this year, from our speakers to our partners to our participants to uh, people from the Wikimedia Foundation, everyone. I know we have um, people all over the world. We have people from um, Africa, Europe, Asia, everyone here. We are so glad that you are here and to support a good cause towards projecting an African project. Thank you once again for joining us and then we would officially want to close this lunch. And then if you have any, any questions, you can kindly email any of us. I would, I would put our emails here so if, if you have any questions regarding um, the contest, I would kindly put our emails on the chats so you can personal email any of us for inquiries. Yes, yeah, so I just dropped my hair. Um, I should also quickly mention um, uh, Dr. Mignandu came today from Howard University, uh, which has a Center for African Studies. Uh, and I know uh, a few of you recently, we tried to work together um, uh, with Wikimedians in Africa. So thank you so much for welcoming uh, Dr. Manyandu today and uh, for making this happen. Thank you. And it, it, I, I might want to add, it would be nice if someone is here today and they've thought about like doing a master's or a PhD at Howard, you should uh, consider it, you know, so. Uh, teacher, well, I'm here, teacher, I'm here. Oh, <laughs> Howard, <laughs> Howard is in Washington, D.C. in the state. The oldest department started in 1953, uh, we gave our first master's in 1966, PhD in 1971. So we do a lot of good work, especially on African languages. We teach the most African languages 
outside um, of South of Africa in America. So uh, big deal. So thanks. Thank you. And um, quickly, Doctor, if um, anyone wants to contact you, how can they contact you? Oh, awesome. Yeah, you just yeah, do uh, in the university's website. Uh, yeah, uh, and especially if you want to do a graduate, there's a lady, I'll put Sia Clark, she's our director for uh, graduate uh, studies. So uh, let's see, everyone, um, Sia Clark. Yeah, introduce yourself to her and say, hey, I've thought about doing a master's or African PhD in African studies, and that's the person. And then I'll just know after that, hey, that's the person from my people. <laughs> great. <laughs> great, so, great, great, yeah. great. Okay, don't say you know me. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank great. you. Thank Thanks you so you. much. I also put uh, uh, the general contact for Africa too, and I'll try and get you over to there as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I don't know if you have anything to say. Make this thing quick. Um, I'd like to acknowledge one or two persons. So we are joined here also for, um, by members from the Ghana Commission of UNESCO. I'd like to say thank you to Apostle Chris Wecha, who is um, in charge of culture in the commission. So Chris, thank you so much for your support. Thank you, Kofi Kwache. Thank you, Moses. <laughs> Thank you to everybody, every everyone who helped make um, this year's launch a success. We say God bless you wherever you are. We know you are very busy, but hey, you, you just said yes to us. And yes to us means yes to Africa. So thank you once again, and may God bless you all. Gilbert, yes, Gilbert, the, the, he is the one behind our translation. Gilbert, a great job done. We thank you so much for helping the people um, within the French community as well. So thank you, thank you so much for, for the wonderful and good job done. God bless you too. Okay, so we are bringing the session to an end. Once again, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.